Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Pilot channel. Have you ever had this experience? You're reading a book and you're enjoying the novel's premise. You like its plot and its characters. All pretty good. But the experience is spoiled by something in the author's style that you find really irritating. I have, and it's really unfortunate. Style problems are not as bad as other problems like slow pacing, wooden characters, or being full of plot holes. Or a problem we have a lot these days where the author's politics gets in the way of a good story. And that's not just woke people who do that. Uh, conservatives do that too, and libertarians as well. No, this style issue is more insidious. And it happens pretty often. The frustrating thing about style issues is that the book has this annoying flaw and it just won't let you forget it. I call this problem a literary tick. First of all, I need to give credit where credit is due. I am a big aficionado of the writer's group whereby you get together with other writers. It could be online, but I prefer to do it physically in a restaurant, enjoy some good food, etc. And you give each other critiques and advice and suggestions and encouragement. And I've been doing this for many years. Now, one of my fellow group writers was a retired psychologist named Ron Friedman, who sadly passed on a few years ago. I have to say that although his style differed greatly from my own, he was very talented. I think the most talented of our group. And he had some short stories published and had won at least one pretty significant award. Anyway, early on, he was pretty critical of my work. But I must admit that I usually deserved it. <laughs> I remember very distinctly how one time he said, you start far too many sentences with the word as. It's like a tick you have. <laughs> I was taken aback. I mean, what? Um, but I had to laugh when I thought about it because I really did do it too often. And here I'm going to give you an example. As Ione boarded the mighty airship, she pondered the technology that could take her across the Atlantic in a mere week. It's a long and kind of a complicated sentence. And it was almost as I couldn't help myself. I love to structure sentences in this way. And I thought it made me sound literary, but if you do it too much, it makes you sound like an amateur, which is the problem. So I beat that tick, and now I use it very, very sparingly. The reason I thought about this issue is that I just finished reading a steampunk series by Stephen Hunt. It's called the Triple Realm Duology. Now, I don't mean to pick on Hunt specifically. I wouldn't use him as an example if I didn't enjoy this book series in pretty much every other way. I'll have some other examples, so I won't be just picking on him. But this one is freshest in my mind. I should also say that although I may be the only person in the world who found these specific practices to be annoying, I doubt it. First, a bit about the series. There are two books. For the Crown and the Dragon, 1994, Green Nebula Press, and 2020, the Fortress and the Frost, same publisher. This is steampunk. It's also been classified as flintlock fantasy because it's almost a little bit more like 18th century rather than 19th. But there are steam engines in it, so steampunk it is, I'd say. The world building in this series is absolutely superb. The setting is an alternate Europe in the steampunk-ish era that is very different from our own world. What happened was, back in Roman times, the rulers started fooling around with black magic and demons and something from other dimensions. I'm not exactly sure what. But it turned out to be very dangerous, and it backfired on them. And as a consequence, Rome sank under the sea, just like Atlantis. And the rest of the continent also was plagued by the problems, the, the magical fallout, if you will, of this action where they had fields and so on, where they had cultivated areas, there's now wild forests, and it's very difficult to uh, cut them back because the trees are like a magical, 
and they're menacing and there's these wild beasts that live in them and many of whom are like part human like with a boar's head kind of like the guy <laughs> was a demon slayer the guy wore the boar's head but they're actual half human creatures so besides that also the whole map of Europe has changed. There's a lot of areas that have been submerged. It's, it's an early form of climate change. <laughs> you know, uh, basically, Spain is an island. Scandinavia is an, an island. Southern Italy is an island. And also, England and Scotland are now separate islands. And so they, in conjunction with Ireland, are the Triple Realm, which is ruled by the same queen, hence the name. But they don't call them England and Ireland. There's like... Emrys and Athelat or something like that. Kind of fanciful alternate names. Anyway, uh, so it's got this cool world building, and there is also some pretty neat technology involved, some interesting coinages. For example, a kettle black is a steam-powered vehicle, usually like a tank. And there is also a race of half humans as i said they're called demi sappy which means half sapient get it pretty cool coinage the protagonists of this work are a military regiment called the dragon browns which is kind of a cool name the dragon is their symbol and they wear brown right that's what the story is kind of about it's about this regiment and they are the worst of the worst they're like conscripts they're like criminals who joined the army to avoid being prosecuted or even hanged. <laughs> and so they do the dirty work. They have the worst, most dangerous battles, etc. But this one in this book is kind of like a plum assignment, or so it seems. They are assigned to bring back this runaway princess, this runaway English princess who went off and married a foreign nobleman in a different country, Eastern Europe somewhere. And the queen doesn't care. She wants her sister back because she's supposed to be married to a different nobleman as part of a political deal, whether she wants to be or not. So there's the setup. Now, the characters are fun. The uh, world building is great. There's a lot of weird culture and religions in there. Very imaginative. But Hunt has a couple of habits I found very, very irritating. First of all, there was a reluctance to use a character's name too much. And I know it can be a problem. For example, if you have one character, you're talking about one character, you can use he or she in the rest of the paragraph to indicate you're talking about the same person, right? But if you have two, it can be a little confusing. And Joe said this, Bob said this. That's why we typically have different paragraphs for change of speaker but what if they are interacting what if they are having a sword fight for example you have to usually use their own name each time now some writers try to avoid that like one character might be tall and the other's fat so the tall man did this and the fat man did that etc yeah it kind of works and i'd say use that sparingly but hunt uses it a lot <laughs> and that's one of the problems so each of the characters has this kind of a separate moniker or nickname that he gives them. And it's not even in the book. It's not even what they call them in the book. It's just something the author has assigned. So, for example, Taliesin is the captain of the Dragon Browns. So he is referred to as the captain. Fair enough, because he is the captain. That rank doesn't change throughout the book. However, there's another character who's a disgraced nobleman called Gunner. He's kind of a ladies' man. He likes fine clothing. So he's described as a dandy. Fine enough, but dandy is some kind of subjective, and yet he's labeled as the dandy again and again, as if he's the only dandy in the freaking world. <laughs> and that bugged me. Just say Gunner. I'd rather hear his name again. There's a woman who is, I guess, Gunner is smitten with her, so he's trying to help her out. She's called Elaine. But she's also a noble woman. So she's the noble woman. There's a hunchback in the in the crew called Letha. He's the hunchback. And I think he's also a poacher. Although I'm confused at who that 
was the same thing or not. The poacher? Okay. I didn't even know he was a poacher. Finally, Quanar Moore. He's a big, burly Scotsman, so he is the Highlander. Makes sense, but I'd rather hear his name. So, that's one thing. It was possible to kind of ignore that, but the, another problem was head hopping, which means you go back and forth between characters and with little fanfare. I have kind of a rule that I will only switch POVs, which I seldom do because I seldom have more than one or two POV characters, but switch POVs at the end of a scene. And you have to make it clear whose head you're in or you confuse the reader. And that happens in this book. Now, another book I recently finished, it was about time travel, by the way. But in this time travel book, they had a lot of characters, but each character segment would always begin with the character's name. For example, uh, Mike Simpson looked down at the paper on his desk and sighed. Exactly. You know that Mike Simpson is the POV right now. And in Hunt's case, he didn't always have this kind of marker that would tell you whose head you were in. So it could be confusing. Also, it was rather quickly paced, which didn't help the situation. At the very end of the first book, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but one of the characters is trapped and you think that they're going to have to have their legs amputated. Well, as it turns out, something happens, kind of a miracle happens. <laughs> Whatever is pinning them down is gone and they don't have to be amputated. But because the book is so fast paced, I was still thinking that that had happened. And I was thinking, where are the pig legs here? <laughs> so it's, it's a problem. I must say it is a problem. And again, not trying to pick on Hunt, but I think a writer's group, whether or not Hunt had actually had one or not, is another matter, but a writer's group will flag that kind of thing and say, I don't like hearing the word dandy all the time, and what happened to the legs? <laughs> now, to go back to what I figure is the preeminent or the archetypal literary tick, I'm going to talk briefly about a thing we call said bookism. And what that means is that some writers, especially in like Victorian times, got tired of using the word said all the time. And it was he said, she said, blah, blah, blah. And they found that kind of irksome. So they decided they would use a different dialogue tag, as we call it, uh, as often as they could, like he intoned or she exclaimed, you know, and it would get ridiculous. It would get to the point where it was silly. And so that became a no-no. So you seldom see it anymore. What the advisors will say is, said is such a common word that it becomes invisible, like the word and. <laughs> and so you don't have to worry about it. I still like to use different tags if they are appropriate. For example, if the character is shouting, you would say he shouted. You wouldn't say he said because it's a shout. Or uh, if it's a question, I would usually say, she asked, rather than she said, because it's a little bit more specific. Said kind of implies a statement, right? That's a matter of personal taste. But see, that's the archetypal literary tick, is like this uh, compulsion to switch it up all the time. And again, you can see this in Hunt's work, in that he has felt he has to switch up the character's name so he doesn't use it too much. No, it's not a problem. We expect you to use the character's name again and again and again, as annoying as it may be for you to type it over and again and again. <laughs> now, I'm going to go into a couple other works, so I'm not just picking on Hunt, and a couple of the writers that I do enjoy and appreciate. Here's one that I think I've mentioned before. Uh, Phil and Kaya Foglio, uh, they do steampunk graphic novels. At least that's how they started. The graphic novels, which kind of a cute cartooning style very fun and it takes place in again in alternate Europe <laughs> and they have this heroine who is a genius hence the title girl genius but she's also kind of ditzy she's kind of like the absent-minded professor type only she's young and cute as well and uh, her name is Agatha Heterdyne now I love the graphic novels but they also later did prose versions 
which sounded like a good idea, right? Problem is that their style has another literary tick. In this case, I'll go into the background of this. As writers, we're supposed to show, not tell. So if a character is surprised, we try to give an attribute of surprise rather than saying Agatha was surprised. So they say Agatha blinked. Because you often blink in surprise, right? But this happens so often that I begin to think Agatha has a problem with her eyes and she better get that checked. <laughs> and that was the most common, but there were other cases where they would use this kind of construction too often. And perhaps the character shouldn't be that surprised that much, or they should have some other reaction, or perhaps you just have to switch it up somehow. <laughs> some other, some other uh, description of surprise. Not picking on them, but again, this kind of detracted from my enjoyment of the books. I read two of the novels, haven't read further. Why? The literary tick. So the third person I'm going to pick on is another writer that I greatly admire, a uh, deceased writer, a grandmaster of the science fiction community, Robert Heinlein. <laughs> so I know he's controversial. I have no problem with his politics, and I think he actually usually melds them pretty well into the book so that it doesn't ruin the story. You definitely know what they are. <laughs> definitely know what his opinions are. Uh, but I love the early stuff, even if it's kind of dated, 50s-ish at times. Uh, but after the 1960s, and he did his groovy countercultural thing called Stranger in a Strange Land, his books were a little bit different. Some were okay. But this particular one came out in 1980, and it was called The Number of the Beast. Now, as far as the premise went, it sounded very promising. Uh, two couples, recently married, are fleeing from this sinister organization, conspiracy, whatever. And they have this dimensional travel device. I don't remember how they got it. It was a while ago. <laughs> and they attach it to this automobile, essentially, and they're traveling through dimensions in a car, <laughs> which is kind of corny, but it's kind of fun. It's it's like Doctor Who. He travels in a phone booth, right? So anyway, the whole premise was cool in that you have dimensional travel, you have a sinister organization, and the number of the beast, which as we know is 666, the real reason that got into Revelations, according to this book, is it refers to the number of dimensions in the universe. Not exactly 666, but 6 to the 6th power to the 6th power, which is like a bazillion. So that opens up some pretty cool possibilities. The problem with this book, though, which is why I didn't finish it, is that these two couples, they have cutesy banter that drives me bananas. And it's not just a little. I know all married couples do that, right? I know Mrs. Desperado and I do sometimes. Usually, though, we're snarking each other and insulting each other instead, but <laughs> which is all in good fun. But they would say something like, oh, my ha handsome husband here. <laughs> uh, and and it would be kind of teasing. You know, like, you know, I'm exaggerating your your benefits. But nonetheless... I just found it so annoying. Oh my God, turn it off once in a while. Get serious. You don't have to be so cool all the damn time. And so maybe sometime I'll get back to it and try to finish this thing. Who knows? And recently they discovered that Heinlein had an earlier version of the book that he had written in 77, never published, and much of it is different. But unfortunately, the first part's the same. <laughs> and that's where I had the problem with this literary tick. So, three examples of works of writers that have had this kind of stylistic issues. Now, I don't know if I'm the only person who has this problem with these things. I really don't. I know, for example, that Hylan was reviewed a lot because he was famous. And one reviewer said that this particular work was very wordy. <laughs> and so maybe that's part of what they meant. All this banter made it, made it wordy. And sometimes the characters will lecture, which can also be excessive. I guess I didn't get that far. It's one of the reasons that I began to question whether I should give numerical ratings to everything, because my own prejudices about some of these things 
can really affect my opinion of a book very strongly. But again, this is why I heartily recommend joining a writer's group because getting this kind of feedback is critical to knowing whether or not your book will be well received and it won't have little issues that bring the reader out of the world and kind of stop you when you say, oh, no, not again. I don't want to see the word dandy ever again in my life. <laughs> so I have this policy as far as writers groups goes. Let's say you have four members and two members give you the same advice about a particular passage. I will take it very seriously. I'll seriously consider it. Three give you that advice. It's gospel. And <laughs> they got to be right. <laughs> so that is kind of my advice to aspiring writers out there. That's something that will help you a lot. Whether it's online or in person, do it. So I'd like you to let me know in the comments if any of you others have had this same problem. Do other writers have this issue where you say, oh, I like the book except for that. Maybe you've read one of my books and you've seen this problem. <laughs> Could be. Uh, anyway, let me know. I'd, I'd be interested to hear if I'm the only one or not. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk word. Also, check out my books on Amazon. I will always have that list in the description. And if I sell a few more, I'll know it's worth it to finish the ones I'm working on right now, <laughs> which I am slowly getting around to. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. <laughs>